I apologize. Apparently, I turned off my mic or something happened there. So let me go ahead and roll back. Um, was that at the very beginning everyone missed? <laughs> my mic got turned off. I'm not sure, sure how that happened. It's the second time I've seen it happen today, though. So hopefully that bug doesn't continue to plague us. Um, welcome, everyone, to First Tuesdays. Uh, I'll just go ahead and start all over here, and uh, hopefully it's not repeating too much for folks. I'm your facilitator today, Jeremy Stroud. Uh, my information is on the screen, but I will type it into chat as soon as I am done with the introductions. Our technical support today is Joe Olivar. Again, I will put his information in the chat. You will see his phone number next to his name up in the participants panel. So if you need him in the short term, it's right there. Uh, I do believe he's away from his desk for just a moment. He's helping somebody locally here, uh, but he'll be back over there in just a moment. First Tuesdays is brought to you by the Office of the Secretary of State, Washington State Library. Uh, we do this with funds provided by the Institute Museum and Library Services. Uh, it's the LSTA uh, funding that we get that, that really helps bring this to you. Now, uh, the Office of Financial Management does have some requirements for us. Uh, if you could please type in the chat um, just the number of participants you have at your location and either your library and organization or your city and state. We just have to do the basic tracking. Um, we don't need to put in your name or anything else with it. So whatever your login information is will be fine. And we'll give folks a moment to do this. I, uh, we don't have our normal facilitator with us today. I usually run tech support, but I've been promoted today. Uh, but that means I'm also doing attendance on the other side. So I'm going to try doing both of those, and then we'll keep moving. All right, thank you, everyone. I do also want to say that after the session, we will have a very short follow-up. It's, I believe, four questions with one optional. Um, and Melissa asks us to do it. It's just a matter of, uh, has this session helped you? A really quick survey. It will be in Blackboard here, so you won't have to go out anywhere else to do that. So without further ado, uh, our presenters today are Kylie Fulmer and Brooke Peterson, uh, the Rural Library Directors from Eastern and Western Washington State. Uh, they're going to review the lessons learned and best practices from their successful Leave the Library nature-based programs. So without Great. further ado, Thanks, Jeremy. Kylie, Brooke, and thanks I'll everybody for joining us this morning to learn more about the um, Cashbox and Backpack programs that Brooke and I have been doing at our libraries in an effort to get more self-directed family programs that encourage active learning at our libraries. I am Kylie Fulmer, and as Jeremy said, I am the director of the Ritzville Library District in eastern Washington. We are a small rural library district, and um, I'm going to ask you guys to bear with me today. I uh, am also, like many small directors, wear a lot of hats, and I am also the, do all the preschool visits for our library, and I've been fighting a cold for the past couple of weeks, so I'm a little bit sniffly today. So um, I'm actually going to be talking a little bit later, so right now I will go ahead and turn it over to Brooke. Good morning, everybody. My name is Brooke Pedersen. I'm the director of the Upper Skagit Library in Concrete, Washington. We just wanted to give you a little visual of where we live in Washington State. Uh, there's concrete. And if you drive through the beautiful North Cascade Mountains, you'll get down there to Ritzville, where Kylie lives. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our cash and concrete program. We've done this for two summers in a row, and we'll be coming up on our third summer. So our library is in Concrete, Washington. Our total service area is about 4,800 people. Uh, we share a building space um, with the East County Resource Center, and our square footage is about 1,600. You can see that we're quite a busy little library. Um, we have daily average visits of about 130 a day, and we have a staff of four. So one of the reasons why I started developing Cash and Concrete was to help to get people out of the library and exploring the town. So why Cash and Concrete? 
um, I wanted to talk about five reasons why we did it. One was uh, to capitalize on the strengths of the area. We really live in a beautiful little spot in concrete Washington, um, but a lot of tourists would just drive on by. So we were wondering what's a reason, how could we get people to stop in town? Number two, there were, we had no concrete specific pamphlets for tourists. So how could we work with the town in an economic development way to uh, just cooperate with the town in that way? Number three, we wanted to give families, both locals and tourists, an activity to do in town, one which leaves participants with a positive memory of Concrete Washington. Uh, number four, we wanted to give kids a reason to interact with their town in a new way. And number five, we wanted to give families a reason to interact with local businesses. Um, and then finally, uh, for, we had three strategic goals for the year, for the last couple of years, and one of them was to encourage and enable civic and community engagement. So how could we do that? So we decided to build on popular geocaching and letterboxer letterboxing orienteering games, and we um, developed a history-themed treasure hunt. We hid nine small boxes, and you can kind of see the size of the box here, and in the small box we had a stamp pad, a stamp, um, we wrote up question and answers, historical themed question and answers that celebrated the town of concrete, and hid them around town. So here's an example. Um, if you drive into concrete, you will see this enormous silo, and it says, Welcome to Concrete. And one of the questions we had was, why did the silos get painted with the Welcome to Concrete sign? And I'll just give you a moment to read through these answers, and if you'd like to vote um, A, B, or C, which one do you think is the right answer? Just a quick re re recap. the. Uh Voting responses are right here in the participants panel. Looks like Kylie voted. Amy Osborne has voted. Not a lot of people guessing. We have we some guesses for C that the Superior Portland Cement Company painted Welcome to Concrete on the silos in 1909. So I'll go ahead and give you the answer here. It is B. The sign in the entire town was painted especially for the filming of This Boy's Life, starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro, 1992. So each stamp in each of the nine boxes, when you put them together in a grid, they created a picture. And you can see it's the silos there. Um, and additional info was included in the booklet on where to go for more local adventures. So here's an example of the booklet we put together. Um, it's eight and a half by 11, and it was the front page was all in color, and the insides were all um, black and white. So we tried to do some so cost saving, um, but it ended up still being a pretty expensive booklet to produce. But here you can see that we went around town and got local sponsorships. And we decided to just do a flat rate of $50 per sponsorship. And I think that local businesses appreciated that. Um, it was a small enough amount that everybody was excited. They were excited about a, a local concrete pamphlet. Um, and it was all around uh, worked really well. So what did we learn with our first summer? Um, we learned that there was actually a curse of the silos. So uh, the silos that I showed the picture of, um, we hid it. A, behind a rock next to the silos. And for some reason, um, the box kept on disappearing down below the silos. No matter how much we um, tried to plug up the holes, the box disappeared about four times. So we had to replace that one over and over again. And of course, we had made these custom stamps. Um, and so replacing that was expensive and hard to do. Um, also, the inky stamps created a lot of vandalism. So town of concrete 
um, public works department had to go out and repaint some areas. Um, it was also time intensive to keep cleaning the boxes and check on the boxes. Um, and also we had a lot of people, the feedback was, well, what do we win at the end? If we complete it, what's next? So what we changed, we wanted to do more cost-effective printing. We wanted to move away from the inking scams. We wanted to move away from the time-intensive box checks. And we decided to come up with a little souvenir coin as a prize. So this was 2016. This is an 11 by 17 um, piece of paper, a trifold. And uh, we printed it in black and white. We didn't print it in color. This is the inside. We had a lo local artist that had done this artwork of the town in uh, the 1980s. And he gave us the permission to adapt it and reuse it for our purposes. And I really love how this one turned out. It gave us natural spots to put the locations and the questions. And we're thinking then that this map will not change in In the coming years, we'll only change the specific cash challenge that we'll include, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So this will stay the same, and that will save on um, staff time as well as we develop the coming years. So here's an example of how we changed. We did have the boxes, um, but then we changed to, uh, if this is a half of an 8 and half by 11 sheet that we laminated, and we put the answer to the historical question there, um, the answer to the cash challenge, and then a QR code where people could um, click on that and um, be led to our Facebook page where there was more information about the cash. So how did 2016 go? We moved from 17 sponsors to 32. So businesses were obviously excited about what we were doing. And it was great to see uh, official sponsor posters in the windows. We um, put together these sponsor posters, and businesses loved putting them in their windows. We distributed 1,800 pamphlets. Um, local Girl Scout troop did the cash and is recommending it and recommended it to other area troops. Um, okay, so here's another little example of a local question. This bridge once set a record for what? Okay, here's your answers. What do you think, A, B, or C? We have a couple of A's, we have a B. Nobody wants to guess C. <laughs> the correct answer is A. Good job, all you A guessers. OK, so what did we learn in 2016? We learned that the souvenir coins uh, were a no-go. People um, would come back and collect them after they finished the cash, but then they wondered, well, then what, what can we spend these on? So um, we started. For this coming year, we'll probably do some kind of a raffle or something different for a prize. Um, we also found that the curse of the silos still existed. Um, so we had uh, put up the laminated sign there over and over and over again, and it kept disappearing. We also realized that we would need to do some more uh, specialized advertising. Um, and perhaps more like a blog on what it's like to actually walk around town and do the cash or um, just expand our advertising. Uh, it was also too open-ended. Um, people were wondering, well, when does it, when does it end? Um, when will we get our prize? Um, it was too open-ended. So um, next year, we want to have a specific date that um, it will end. Also, we realized that it was the restaurants that ran out of the pamphlets the fastest. So I think it's when people had time to sit and um, look at the pamphlets, that's, that's really where they picked them up. 
So another, so I kind of talked about some of these things. Um, we'll have a more specific timeline this coming year. And uh, I guess I didn't really explain the cash challenge. So we had the local history questions in the pamphlet. And then we also, in this last year, we put a riddle with each spot. And the answer to each riddle was on the same eight and a half, the half of the eight and a half by 11 laminated paper. And so we, we were thinking that the history questions would kind of keep the adults interested and the riddle questions would keep the kids interested. And uh, that actually worked really well. So um, we'll come up with a fresh cash challenge for this coming year. I'm thinking maybe some kind of um, a crossword that each answer would be at each spot. Um, but that's part of the fun of planning for the new year. Um, also trying to think about ways we could get more feedback. So if we had people complete an online survey, and then they could get entered into a grand prize drawing. Um, also expanding the cache to include more outlying areas. Um, a lot of tourists, uh, you know, they like getting out of their car, but um, if we could even further lead them down the road um, with more history themed questions, I think that would be great. Um, and also perhaps having a dedicated website. Um, here is a visual of our budget. So in 2015, we printed 900 pamphlets um, for $800. The stamp was $30. The boxes were about $40. Um, and so the total was about $900. With our $50 sponsorships, we had 850 So it pretty much covered the program. In 2016, with our 32 sponsors, we had more than enough to print with our cost-saving pamphlet. Um, we got to print 2,000 pamphlets, um, and we still have money to spare for this coming year. Um, so we really uh, liked the new pamphlet. Um, and then we'll, we'll have money for more great prizes for this coming year, too. So our major takeaways were that once the program was designed and set up, it pretty much ran itself. The program then became more about me visiting with local businesses and organizations, and it was fun to be able to check in with them at the beginning of the summer and also at the end of the summer. Um, and we realized that, like summer reading programs, counting the finishers is not an adequate reflection of success. Having folks actually just pick up the pamphlet and interact with it was a positive experience. Um, local kids now remember things about the history of their town. And it also um, met our strategic goal of encouraging and enabling civic and community engagement. So that is all I have uh, for Cash and Concrete. And we could answer some questions now, or Kylie could do her spot and we could answer some um, Yeah, if you want to take like one or two, that's Kylie. fine, and then we can move on and do the rest of them at the end. Does that work? Sure. Does anybody have a question for me right now? So it looks like I'm not getting any immediate questions, but if you guys think of any, um, feel free to ask them at the end. And Kylie, take it away. All right. Hi again, everybody. Um, so I am, like said earlier, the director of the Ritzville Library District. And as you can see, we are in a, a Carnegie Library built in 1907. Um, we are actually in the middle of a remodel project to install an elevator and an ADA bathroom to finally make it ADA accessible. So I'm actually talking to you today from our high school library where we are temporarily relocated. So I have a question for all of you guys before we get started. I'm curious how many of you encourage people to get outside and engage with nature in your communities as part of your library programs. I know that there are some libraries that do national park or state park passes. Um, they offer telescopes for checkout. They do story walks. They partner with our Parks and Rec for summer reading programs. So if you do, I would, yeah. And if you want to include what you do in the notes, that would be really interesting, too. Uh, you can either just say yes or no in the notes, or you can do up at the top with the, the check mark. I was going to comment on that. Um, folks may notice I changed the polling to be yes or no, so you can use that if you'd like.
Oh, great. It looks like a lot of you guys do. Yeah, so if you do, I, like I said, I would, would love to see some of the things that you do. Storybook walks, nature backpacks, great. So, like several of you, we didn't do anything at our library, and um, we were reading the Washington clippings that the State Library puts out a few years ago, and one of my staff saw that another library in our state was offering backpack kits. And we started thinking about it, and like all good libraries, we thought that was a great idea to steal. And so we started considering, you know, what would that look like for us? Because when we think of Washington State, we think of, you know, that it's this, you know, beautiful wonderland with mountains and the oceans right there and rainforests and, and all these great places to explore and get outdoors. But we are in eastern Washington where it looks a little bit different. Um, we are in a, a charming part of the state called the Channeled Scablands. Um, so it doesn't immediately, you know, strike people as someplace that you'd want to get out and explore. But let me get my hand out here. We are less than an hour from Blue Falls, which is our state waterfall that has lots of wildlife and hiking trails. We're 45 minutes from the Turnbull National Wildlife Refuge and the Drumhead Drumheller Channel's National Natural Landmark. There's an annual Sandhill Crane Festival in a nearby community, and there are countless public fishing areas, local lakes, and rivers. And I kind of facetiously include this photo over here. It's a, um, a nearby dried out lake bed, and you can see you know, it has the, the boat ramp and everything. Um, it dried up a long time ago, but we do actually have lots of really good fishing holes around here. Um, not only do we have uh, I apologize for interrupting. I heard you mention uh, getting that your hand, but we don't actually see it on screen. You need to click or click and drag to get that to show up. Can you guys see it now? Uh, yes, that's perfect. Okay. So anyway, I'll go through really quick. So this is Police Falls, and this is the Turnbull Wildlife Refuge, John Heller Channels, and my my joke of a of a fishing lake. All right. So not only do we have lots of natural outlets nearby, but we also have a huge interest in geocaching in our area. Um, we have almost 300 geocache locations in and around our town alone, um, and there are several more throughout our county. So, um, Jeremy, if I could get you to play this video, it is of a really fun geocache location that we actually have at our library. <laughs> Kylie, I'm muting your mic for a moment so we can hear the video. So we do think we're pretty clever. One of my board members is an active um, geocacher. And he came up with that idea, so I think it's a lot of fun. All right, Jeremy, are we, how do I get back to my screen? There we go, perfect. Um, so there are, there's a lot of interest in getting outdoors in our area. There's a lot of opportunities for it. So we went back and we thought, why backpack kits? Well, it fits our mission and our vision to provide educational and recreational resources to help our community explore and discover. Um, it also fit in with one of our strategic plan goals to help kids succeed in school. Research shows that reconnecting youth to the outdoors is critical to ensuring healthy, active communities. Outdoor recreation brings families closer together, helps kids learn in school. So we saw that this really fit with what we were trying to accomplish already. It also fit a need in our community. Um, when we started looking into this, our movie theater had recently had to shut down. Our bowling alley had closed. There wasn't a lot going on in the community for families to get out and do. We're also a pretty low-income community, and it allowed patrons an introduction to an activity before they had to invest a lot of money in it. And it also allowed us to show that we're a little bit more than just books, that we were trying to really promote recreation beyond the library. And I have a photo here of some of our, our young users using our fishing backpack kit last summer. So we decided to go ahead and go for it, and um, we started looking into what this other library in our state had done, and they had um, gone out to this company, Tom Bin, to get the backpacks. So we just 
contacted Tom Bin and asked um, how much they cost because we were hoping to put together a grant proposal and you know just getting our budget items together. And they got really excited about it and said, you know what, hey, we're just going to donate you the backpacks valued at $90 a piece for nothing. They just thought it was so exciting that we wanted to do this. So then we had to start thinking about what we wanted to put in these three backpacks. And we decided to do fishing, geocaching, and birding because they all could be enjoyed as a family, but sometimes the initial investment into the equipment was just too expensive for people. Also in our state, 14 and under don't need a fishing license, so we thought that that was a really good way to encourage young families to get out and do activities. We also, so in addition to Tom Ben sponsoring the backpacks, um, an Ace Hardware in a nearby town donated refurbished fishing poles. Um, my dad is also, um, he's retired and he likes to wander around and find things and he um, also collects fishing poles that he finds along the river in nearby towns and so he was able to donate a lot of fishing poles to us that way so we have a whole bunch now. And then we also got some donations from a local family and our friends at the library established a fund to cover the cost of the initial supplies. So what is in the kits? I mentioned that we have fishing, geocaching, and birding. So our fishing um, kit cost about $50 just because all of our fishing poles were donated. So we had the fishing poles, the tackle, and the um, tackle box. And then we also included some resources um, about the local fishing and fishing guides from Fish and Wildlife who were really generous in providing information to us and then also some other books, you know, introductions um, for families. The geocaching has um, the GPS unit and it also has some safety equipment like a reflective vest and a first aid kit. That was a recent suggestion by a, a user who said, you know, that we've we want to promote people to know how to do these activities safely and in a fun manner. And so including things like that so that they they can do this safely. So that was a good suggestion. Um, and then we also included books to, to teach people how to do this that were new to the, the activity. And altogether that cost about $230. And if anybody's interested, I have the full list with all the URLs for what we purchased for the kits um, along with the pricing. It's specific to our area, but it still might be useful if you want to contact me later to get those. Um, and then in our birding backpack, we included the binoculars and then um, some bird sound CDs, some introduction, you know, bird guides. And then we also worked with our local Audubon Society to get, you know, some rules about how to do birding, how to do it safely, and, and information like that. Um, like I mentioned, we're still refining the contents of each kit based on feedback, but that's basically what's in them. So I have another question for you. Does your library catalog a library of things? We've all started circulating unusual materials, unique materials, and so I'm wondering how many of you are cataloging these things? So if you guys want to do a yes or no in the check mark, or if you want to put it in the notes. All right. It looks like it's a pretty even mix. So we have started cataloging unique materials. We um, kind of dipped our toes into it with the baking pans and um, e-readers and games and puzzles and preschool STEM kits, things like that. And I feel like each one is very unique and different. Each time we have to rethink how we're going to catalog it. So we started off cataloging these kits um, by just creating very basic original records where we just put in the title, the extent, which you give a full description of the contents, and a collection code. It was very basic. We started by barcoding each item in the bag to make sure everything was returned. And that got really old with my staff really quick. It took forever to check things in and out. Some of these backpacks have several items in them, and so the people, you know, having to be at the desk and checking in all of those. So as you can see on our, tell me if you can see my hand. If you can see right here, our geocache backpack, it has everything listed out in the kit with an individual barcode, and we decided that was crazy. So as you can see with our fishing, it just has, just the one item. So we started barcoding just the backpack, and then we used volunteers later to go through the backpack and make sure that everything is in there, that it lines up with the extent record. We also had to promote the backpacks. So we did a kickoff introductory program our very first summer, 
with local experts. So we got somebody from the Spokane Audubon Society, our nearest society. We got a local geocaching expert to come in and talk about what was the kits and how to use them. And then we got somebody from a local sporting goods store to come in and talk about fishing and what it, uh, locally, um, like what fish they might expect and, and good holes to go to. We also had a prime time family reading program um, that's has a part of it where it's supposed to do library advertising, what cool things we have going on. And so I was able to promote this as part of that. And actually, a lot of the kids that attended that program that they and their families started to really check out these kits, which was exciting to see. We also partnered with our annual city's geocaching cash cow event, and they allowed us to um, to promote the kits to people. We figured if they were interested in geocaching, they were probably interested in other outdoor pursuits. And we advertise on our website, our Facebook and Instagram pages, especially during the summer when people are most interested in these. And then our final way to promote it was we carved out a dedicated space in our library. So we had this shelf up here. Um, with our magazines on it and some reading area. And we decided to go ahead and move that shelf so that we could put the backpacks out on display. For a while, we were keeping the fishing poles in the office because we just figured keep them out of the, the way. Um, it ended up that my staff just tripped on them all the time because um, we have a very small office. And so we bought the little fishing pole stand. And that has actually been the best way to promote these because um, especially with the men, they walk into the library, they see those nice fishing poles, and they want to know instantly what is this all about. So that's probably been the best way to promote these to people. So we started this program in 2015. Um, in 2016, Tom Bin, the backpack sponsor, came back to us and said, we just think this is such a cool idea. We'd like to give you another backpack. And how could we turn that down? So we um, started brainstorming ideas for what we wanted this one to be, and we decided to focus on hiking. So um, it has things like a compass, binoculars, headlamp and multi-tool, some first aid equipment, and then local flora and fauna identification books. Again, it's specific to our area, and we are also trying to educate patrons about how to do these activities safely, which is why we include so much of the first aid equipment. And the total for that one came out to be about $258. All right, so lessons learned. Like I said, when we were talking about cataloging, there's no need to barcode all the items. Um, that was, yeah, my staff were really happy when we stopped doing that. We also realized we needed to start considering liability. I was at a library meeting um, about a year after we had started um, offering these backpacks and somebody pointed out, well, what happens if somebody gets a fishing lure stuck in their eye? And I went, oh gosh, we've never even thought about that. So we now have included a hold harmless card in each kit that says, by checking out this backpack kit, you acknowledge that there are risks involved with doing these activities. Um, we also thought that replenishing supplies was going to be a huge issue. Our friends set aside a whole bunch of money for us that first year, especially we were thinking for the fishing kit to replace the tackle. And we didn't tell people that they needed to replace anything, um, but the, it, they've always come back replenished. There's always more bait in the, the tackle box, and so it's never been a problem. But we do have money set aside just in case. We also realized that uh, not everybody knows how to use a GPS unit, so we get a lot of questions about that, so we've had to start providing instruction on how to use the various equipment in the kits. And then we also realized that it's kind of about educating people about these different activities. The fishing and the geocaching kits have been particularly um, popular, but some, especially the birding, hasn't been as popular, and I think it's just because people don't quite quite know what to do with it or they think it's not quite for them and so there's an opportunity to tie more in with our, our Audubon Society and with our local um, wildlife refuges to kind of tie in with the programming they do and promote it to people, I think. Oh, I see your guys' question. It is not a giant backpack. It is just, yeah, it was just on a table and all the other backpacks are further behind. So thanks for clarifying that in the notes. So talking about the opportunities for these backpacks, we do have our future plans. Um, we, ha we had some staff shortages, and so it didn't allow us to quite do as much as we wanted to do last summer. And then we are also 
an hour away from any of our major areas that have Audubon societies or fishing experts and things like that. So working with some of those um, people to get them to come to our rural location can be a little bit difficult sometimes. And, and some of them had staffing changes that made it hard. So we're trying to get get plans going for this summer um, to promote them a little bit more actively. So some of the things we'd like to do is to partner with our local fish and wildlife a little bit more, plan community hikes perhaps, you know, get people out seeing where they can go fishing or where are good hiking opportunities. Do something like Brooke is doing with a geocache challenge to work with our, our city's cash cow challenge that they do every year. And then just working with our local wildlife refuges to promote local wildlife events. We also are working on creating a learning garden. I think there's a lot of ways to tie in, getting promoting just getting outdoors in general to our community. So trying to tie it in with the programs we already have going. Um, so yeah, those were our lessons learned and what we're hoping to accomplish with our backpack kits in the future. And that is it for me as well. Oh, sorry, I just saw. What is a learning garden? It is. Well, it's not a community garden, so it's not. Um, you know, people think of community gardens where people come in and have their plot that they rent um, and that they take care of. And we are trying to do it more as a learning garden where people are coming in for library programs, um, where we are leading them in taking care of the garden as a whole, learning about composting, about water collection, um, about sustainable gardening and seed collecting, and then tying library programs in around that. And then also, it'll just be a nice green space close to the library where we hope to also do summer reading programs. Yeah, are there any other good questions? Dusty, that's awesome. I forgot to mention, so um, Tom Ben, the backpack providers, were really excited about what we were trying to do. So they decided to offer um, to the rest of the states that I think I think it was directed at small and rural libraries to, um, if anybody was interested in getting backpacks, if they had a plan for how they wanted to fill them, that they would donate backpacks to other libraries as well, based on the success of our program. So that was really, really awesome of them to do. And I think it's really exciting to see that Dusty just said that they just got their backpacks in. OK, before people, um, before people want to take off, I think. Oh, that's a good want to oh. uh, to put that survey out there that I mentioned earlier. And then we can keep talking, asking questions. I just wanted to get this up there before I forgot. OK. I just saw Stacy had a question. How often do they get checked out? So like I said, our phishing and geocaching ones are the most popular. Um, and we do, we do place a limit on them in the summer that they cannot be renewed. They follow our general circulation, um, which is two weeks. And we do limit it to um, adult checkout only just because of the cost associated. And parents don't want to, they want to know that their kids aren't checking them out, um, since they do cost anywhere from 50 to almost $300 to replace. Um, so the fishing kit gets checked out. It's been checked out um, 15 times. And the geocaching one, 11. The birding one, like I mentioned, hasn't been as popular as five. And then when we introduced the hiking one, it got checked out um, seven times last summer. So any other questions for Brooke or I? All right, well, yes, like Brooke said, thank you all for attending. And if you have any other questions or you want to follow up with us to get um, any copies of any of Brooke's handouts or any of the lists, like I said, that we have um, the URLs for everything that we purchase for our kids, just go ahead and contact us and we can send those to you. The archive for this uh, session should be up within the next couple of hours. Uh, I think the big difficulty we have is the people that approve web pages are out this morning. <laughs> so as soon as they're in, it'll be up. Good. All right, thank you for joining us, everyone. I see a number of people are typing here. Um, so we'll see if there are any other questions. And Vince, yeah, uh, if you want to put your email in here, I will send you the archive as soon as I have it.